Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 87 of the Citrix Session. I'm your host, Andy Whiteside. Got a, got a crew with me today. I think Bill's uh, busy hunting down some, some consulting. Oh, there he is. Sorry, Bill. We I'm here. Didn't even realize you're on yet. How's it going? Okay, how are you? Bill's, Bill's my long-term co-host, so we got to bring him up first. Um, we were just talking to Sean about how organized his office, his bonus room office was, and then we pull yours up. It's Oh, it's I'm going to go, go off camera now. No, no, you're good. Look, here's the thing. <laughs> your mess or somebody else's mess, you know where stuff is in your mess, which by the way, yours is, isn't usually this messy. I don't know if you were doing some cleanup this weekend or what, but um, you know, you ask somebody about their workspace, right? Going back to technology and you take somebody's desk, which is really what was the desk before the desktop, it was the desktop. And you know, people have, people are pilers, they pile stuff up, but they know where their stuff's at. Mm -hmm. uh, it's your workspace. And that's, you know, kind of what we'll talk about some today, maybe with Google here, but also talk about just in general with the Citrix world, it's, you know, it's your workspace and making things where you need it to be as part of providing a great digital workspace. Yeah, agreed. So uh, with us also, we have Ben Rogers. Ben's been on for a long time. Ben's a local sales engineer here, as well as a healthcare sales engineer. Ben, how's it going? It's going well, Andy, and I tell you, I'm really excited about today's guest and the topic because this kind of hits home for me, and I'm actually seeing some of this happening in the marketplace. So not to not to give too much away, but I'm excited to be here today. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, we were chit-chatting a minute ago. I'll tell you a quick, quick story. Uh, my kids are now college age, so I'm now going back to campus and going to football games, and then my wife and uh, I got invited to, to fraternity parties the other night. It was kind of weird, but man, you'd, life life really comes full circle at some point. Um, all right, John Spallone. John's been with uh, Zintegra now for what? Is it is it two months or two years, John? Which is it? Uh, it's uh, we're in month two now. Awesome. And I know doing the podcast is probably your favorite thing about the job, right? Oh, definitely. <laughs> um, any background? Uh, I know you come over from the Citrix world and doing a lot of things with Microsoft. What's your what's your Google story look like? Um, actually, I got a pretty cool story that uh, experience that we had this past year in a pandemic. So okay. once we get into this, I'll, I'll cover a little bit more in detail. All right. Well, we've got Sean on from Citrix. Sean, how's it going? Hey, hey, hey. good. How is everybody? Sean, your, uh, your title over at Citrix, I always find interesting. You want to tell our audience what that title is? I think it's evangelist. You, uh, um, Lions marketing evangelist, maybe. Did you ever think you would be an evangelist? You know, it's, it's actually a very fitting title. I don't want to drag us down the rat's nest right off the bat, but it evolved when uh, I worked for a company called Softricity and they were acquired by Microsoft and Microsoft brought us all in one at a time. And they said, well, what do you want to be at Microsoft? And I said, I, I kind of always dug the, the title evangelist. And I, at that time, I actually owned a church and I'm like, yeah, evangelist makes sense. And they said, okay, you're an evangelist. And I've just got to work that in uh, ever since. Yeah. Well, that, you know, if we're doing our jobs, no matter what your role is, you're selling. And I put selling in air quotes, you're evangelizing the product that you right. believe in and you work for it, hopefully. And I know you do, you believe in what it is you're doing um, makes it super easy. It does. It does. And it, it's, you know, it is uh, it's a great position to be in to kind of get everybody excited and in, in, into the technology and describe it into terms that can be understood. So today's topic was, is the blog written by Sean, Sean Donahue, um, and the title of it is, I lost screen, is uh, the Chrome OS and Citrix story. It's very relevant for me. I've got a nonprofit that we, uh, you know, use Google Cloud Ready uh, operating system to convert uh, x86 devices, four gigs or more. But last night I needed to test something, so I grabbed a one gigabyte laptop somebody had donated to the nonprofit and I put the uh, cloud ready on it through a WDS Windows deployment server system mm -hmm. uh, just to see if it would work and see what the test would look like and it worked and then I got in I got, got in my virtual desktop through Citrix and it worked great I was like wow this is a, a 15 year old one gig laptop running cloud ready and it worked and I was so excited about it I posted it on LinkedIn I just saw that actually before we started recording. I saw that post and I was actually trying to figure out if I could identify how old that beast was that you were running that on. It, it, it had a Windows 7 sticker on it. So it must be roughly 12 or so years old is what I would guess. Yeah. Anything. 
I would say so, yeah. Well, Sean, I also have another tie in to this topic specifically. So uh, I think what we're going to talk a lot about here is zero trust and, and, and lowering the attack vector from the endpoint perspective and accessing through workspaces and virtual delivery methods. I, uh, somebody from Google posted the other day a, a, a post that uh, Chrome OS had never been exploited, and I, I just reshared it. And I must have had five security guys like chastise me for it because they were talking about how you shouldn't post stuff like this and that makes you vulnerable and attackable. I think they missed my point, but at the same time, their reaction kind of helped me make my point is, well, yeah, everything's attackable, but I mean, what, what major exploits are there going to be for things that are, um, you know, very, very, very much mitigating the risk to begin with? Tell, tell us why you wrote this blog. Uh, well, I actually, I had a, an opportunity to, um, to speak to one of the people at, uh, at Chrome, the guy's name is Richard Ashe. Um, and it was ahead of, if I remember correctly, the HIMSS event, the healthcare uh, information event in Vegas, but it was also a virtual event. And he was telling me, so whenever I write a blog, there's always two titles to it. There's the one I want to use. And then there's the one that the blog editor uses. <laughs> <laughs> so the one I wanted to use was, uh, you know, like you know, two words, zero ransomware where or something like that. And that just came out from Richard uh, during the interview where he told me there had been no reported ransomware attacks on Chrome devices. And that just, I mean, that caught me off guard, jaw hitting the floor. It's not something you're used to hearing Uh to be out there and to be evidenced as, you know, hey, yeah, there haven't been any ransomware that we know of uh, on a Chrome device. So, Sean, I have uh, this topic I like to bring up for people around ransomware. What's what's the driver for all the recent ransomware attacks? Oh boy, that is uh, that's a tough one. One of the fact that I hear about, because I've, I've heard this covered uh, in the press and on the news and everything, and you know, the rest of our panel probably has uh, experience uh, in two cents too, but the, the, the sudden recent shift to remote working and people working on non-corporate uh, secured devices, so to speak, um, I think has really added to uh, the the landscape and the threat vector, uh, as they call it, uh, kind of opening up or leaving a lot of people a lot more opportunity for uh, the uh, unscrupulous players to uh, try to take advantage of it. Yeah, that's that's certainly one element that gets talked about. The other rest of the guys have probably heard me ask people this question before. Any anybody else want to chime in? So what do you think about, uh, what do you think about, can you see the screen, Sean? Uh, I see a bunch of handsome looking guys. What do you think about the comment that- And that's my... Stallone too. You know, before he joined VDX, he had a full head of hair. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. Very true. <laughs> well, I just realized I wasn't sharing my screen. What do you think about this, uh, this thing? The rise of digital currency. So- so from my perspective, everything is money related, you know, mm -hmm. other than your religion and your family, everything's money related, which sometimes even religion and family end up there. You know, the ability for companies now to uh, hold someone hostage and get paid on it in a somewhat non-traceable way has really been what's driven the ransomware rise uh, is the fact that digital currency exists. And so now you don't have to have a bank account they transfer the money to and you close it instantly. Right. You can literally just anonymously get the money. Yeah, it's a current. It's a it's an industry now, and it's a money making industry to hold people hostage. Yeah, but from a technologist perspective, um, John, um, what uh, Sean mentioned about the the remote working scenario and the attack vulnerabilities being exploited more and more uh, because people are remote and there's more ways to attack it, and it and it exposes you know the challenges we've always had or we've had for a long time. What are your thoughts? I, I agree with that 100%. I mean, uh, I, like I alluded to earlier, uh, the experience we had this past year, you know, with the pandemic, the kids are working remote from the school and the classroom, working at home. Well, our county actually had a ransomware attack 
uh, took down the entire school system. So, I mean, I think our school for our county is over 800,000 kids. Um, so it was a huge impact. Now everybody's running these old Windows devices and you figure they're doing their cycles of updates. The kids have to be in the classroom to get those updates. They hadn't been in school. They hadn't been getting those updates and been getting virus updates. You know, they're all just offline working from home and it just crushed it. Uh, the entire infrastructure went down. <clears throat> so not only these kids have the pandemic they had to deal with, but now this ransomware attack, uh, you know, we got notifications, text alerts going across saying, hey, remove off the, all the apps off your mobile devices, remove everything off of any desktops or laptops. And then the users, the parents were left with a quick little word document that they shot out, said, hey, here's how to tell if you got the ransomware or not. Now, they had just started a pilot program with Google and just started with some of the uh, Chromebooks out there. Now, once they got everything figured out, hey, we don't have any problem with the Google books. What they did was to say, okay, everybody in the county, there's four sites you can go to within the county. You had to go alphabetically during times, but it was basically bring us to Windows laptop and we're going to give you a Chromebook. And that's the entire county within, I guess it was about two weeks, had completely pulled every Microsoft device back in and just went to the Chromebooks because they didn't have the issues with that. Now, they had some other issues that arose from applications and SaaS services that the teachers use that needed a Windows OS to run off of. But hey, things were in the Citrix session here. That's where their Citrix side of the house came into play on the Chromebooks to help those teachers out to educate these kids further during this impact. But I mean, it was a total nightmare. It just, it was crazy, crazy. And I can't even imagine a parent who's not even in tech, how they reacted and felt about this during the whole situation. Yeah. yeah it's our job in technology to try to protect them from what they don't know. They don't know. And if you can just you know, mitigate the risk right out of the gate or you know, in the second phase, Makes a huge, huge impact. Bill, Ben, any comments, thoughts? Uh, I mean, from my perspective, I just just think about the difficulty of, you know, when the pandemic hit and started, how corporations, you know, they had to have good grip on the inventory they had. They had to know where that inventory was going. And we've all worked in the field enough to know that's just not necessarily the case all the time. So now you're looking at your infrastructure being completely dist distributed across wherever and just how do you keep up with that? So I see going to a thin style model like the Chromebook being a good move because then you really do reduce your attack surface and then combining it, you know, with our endpoint product so that you can manage it, update it, all that. I could see that being the way to move, but having all that in place at the beginning of the pandemic, how many companies were really set up that way? I mean, I got lucky. The company I work for was 100% Citrix. So they could send their employees home, have them come back in through the portal. But how many companies were really set up that way? And how many companies were having to really do things on the fly that I bet a lot of them 18 months later still are struggling with how they deal with this distributed work from home model that we've gone into. So Ben, would you say that uh, in those on the fly moments, a lot of the security concepts became second thoughts? Oh, definitely. Because it, it, what you're doing is, you know, you got two things going on. You got the employees stressing out that they're being set home. They're wondering how they're going to get their work done, what their productivity is going to be. And then you got the back end IT staff that's trying to figure out how to facilitate this while they're trying to calm down the end user mass of, you know, we're working this out. So definitely security hit the floor. And even today, like I'll give you an example. I was I don't want to name the company, but I was in a company. And I noticed the guy was using his cell phone. And I was like, what's up with the cell phone? Why are you using that in corporate? And he was like, my cell phone works better than the corporate device they have sitting here. And so I'm sure you've got a lot of that going on. Yeah. Hey, Bill, I want to get you included here. Have you uh, had any interactions with uh, the Google endpoint story as it relates to providing an enterprise class solution that's secure? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, you and I will remember from years ago when we got the free Chromebook that that was uh, my first in, my first involvement with uh, 
with the Chrome OS. And of course, we've had some customers that have leveraged it as well. Uh, so yeah, I've got some experience with it. It's a, it's a really solid platform now, and, and the integration with Citrix uh, takes it a long way towards addressing a lot of those security needs that John and, um, and Ben were talking about. So Bill, I'll challenge you on this real quick. You got that uh, Chrome, that free Chrome device for taking a Google training at a Citrix conference how long ago? Oh, four years probably, four, maybe more than five, that. Four to five years ago. Can you still use that Chromebook? I can. I, I can too. I used it yesterday. It's mm -hmm. five years old and it's still very relevant. Mm -hmm. That's another element of this story that we haven't focused on here, but that type of delivery, that type of device without the bloatware on it, um, without the ability to add a lot of boots up to it. and the, I mean, yeah. just so fast to boot up and get ready and get going. I've got Chromebooks all over the place. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite stories, uh, not to cut you off, Andy, but one of my favorite stories is going out uh, to our Santa Clara office and competing in a, um, a competition called Demo Warrior. And my demo was going to be on Chromebooks in healthcare. And so I stopped on my way to Logan Airport. I stopped at a Best Buy, picked up a Chromebook. And then when I got to the Demo Warrior competition in Santa Clara, I just at the in the conference room itself, just, you know, powered it on, logged into Citrix workspace and boom, I was up and running with a, a full on demo, which included uh, 3D renderings of a, a heart image to demonstrate how doctors could use them and be secure and be anywhere. Right. Um, but just ah, so fast and so easy. The, the idea you could swing by a Walmart, grab a Chromebook and be up and running by the time you connected the uh, audio video in the conference room. That's, yep. that's true. It's a true story. Yep. John, I have a question for you on your, your uh, school story. How many yes, users sir. did they, how many users did they have to change out in that two week period? Give us a number of how many devices, how many users. I mean, put, put some numbers behind that. Well, see, that's a great thing about our County. They're just horrible at giving out real numbers. <laughs> so as a parent and a tech parent, I was asking a lot of those questions. Uh, they wouldn't give those answers because at the same time they were going through the whole federal investigation working with those teams. So they really couldn't let out a lot of it. Now, I know from our school where, where my daughter was, it just within them, it was 7% of the devices, which included all the teachers, because the faculty, some of them were still going into the office to work on a limited schedule. So about 7% of those were switched out within the first week alone. But I mean, it just, it was chaotic. You figure you've got 800,000 students. Uh, I believe the pilot that they had going on for the Google Chromebooks was only covering uh, four different schools within the area. We got to read. Yeah, we got feedback coming from the Yeah, go ahead and mute uh, just for a brief second, guys. Let's see if it's coming. John, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so what had happened was, is they booked out that pilot with four different schools. Now, the way that they break it down is that includes elementary, middle school, and high school. So they picked in each direction within the county. So just within our, our school alone, there's 8,800 kids. So I, I would say you're dealing with probably, I don't know, what, 32,000? um users that were out there wow that's an impressive number there if that's real if that's really the number they had to exchange the reason i ask is i had a client that they've made the decision to go google uh chromebooks and they're doing it differently what they're telling their windows users is you can keep the device we're going to we're going to ship you a new device so the economics of these boxes which i just found hard to believe but you know the the Finance people were like, nah, it's it's much easier for us to ship them a Chromebook, let them do whatever they want to with the Windows book. Now, of course, on the back end, they're removing it from AD. And so the user has to be smart enough to know how to repurpose that Windows machine. But I've seen a customer go, we don't care about the Windows boxes. Do with them what you want. We're gonna we're gonna bring you with Chromebook and bring you back in. 
Um, you know, and that has shocked me because that uh, is, a, is a large investment that they're just letting the users have. Now, they've got to make sure that they get wiped and all those things, but uh, they have made the decision not to try to bring those units back in. They just cut bait and said it is what it is, and they're now shipping out Chromebooks to, to their users, and they say it's making economic sense. So the cost per unit is obviously pretty attractive. I had to buy one for my son. It, it was a you know, I had to do it. I didn't justify it on cost or anything, but it sounds like that this is becoming a very economic, economical model for people to go into and not have to do an exchange, just ship a new unit out. Right. And then I look at, I see a news story locally here about how they handle the Chromebooks that have been damaged by the students. If you think of how kids from elementary school and then the high school kids are even worse. And I have a, a son who's in high school and I can't imagine trying to deal with his Chromebook and what damage can happen to it, but they just rotate it through. Just give us the Chromebook that's busted. Don't try to fix it at all. Give it to us. And then they, you know, ship them another one. And all they have to do, I mean, it's automatically with the, the Chromebook management tool that's on it. And then, you know, if Citrix EMM is in play too, boom, workspace is preloaded on it. Bada bing, bada boom, as they say in Brooklyn, you're up and running in no time at all. And you haven't lost anything as opposed to, do any of you guys remember the days in remote working when it was only like uh, the elite executive was gonna work from home one day a week or something like that. And you had to go to their house and configure some beige box in their home office for the you know VPN credentials and all that nonsense to get up and running. Then think of today where they just drop shipping thousands of these devices out without any manual intervention. Blows my mind. Yeah, back in those days when you had to personalize their Palm Pilot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, and it's it's interesting though, because, uh, you know, I'm actually talking to a lot of customers today um, that are looking at the Chrome direction to go to. Um, I know we covered in our last podcast uh, about the latest updates with the multimedia uh, updates that have come out with Workspace. So a lot of customers are looking at this and saying, hey, you know, I can get that Teams functionality. I can get that Zoom functionality and still use the Chromebook and centralize my management going back to Ben's point. You know, we got everything out there. Here, I can just ship them out a Chromebook. The cost is low uh, and I just manage their account and I can identify where that user and what device they're connecting from. So if they're not using that Chromebook, I can start slap them down and, you know, put them in where I need to go and then still give them those Windows-based applications on an as-needed basis. Instead of having, you know, 2,000 licenses for the entire company, I now can drop that down to what I actually need for functioning because there's a lot of users that don't use that task-based application on their laptops. Because I want to do something real quick here. I want to force us to stop talking about Chromebooks or Chromeboxes, which we haven't talked about Chromebox at all. It, it, so um, Sean wrote this article and specifically the title and very much of the content is about Chrome OS. Like this is a uh, Intel based Lenovo $200 device that I load the Chrome OS on via Google Cloud Ready, which is their operating system. Um, you know, I don't want people to get confused by, oh, I don't want a Chromebook. I don't want a Chromebox. Most people don't even know what a Chromebox is. Anything x86 can run the Chrome OS these days because of the cloud ready piece. And that just makes this story even more expansible, more evolvable, more cost effective. And then you throw in the fact that this Chrome OS thing was built to be in the cloud or built to be managed by the cloud from day one. And now all of a sudden you have stories like John's uh, County being able to do what it did because it was meant to happen that way, not because they had to retrofit it. Sean, I know you probably talked to Richard some about the, uh, the Chrome OS uh, variants at this point, the, the handful they have that are you know, very tight, very secure and all that, and, and, not, and not something that's gonna be superly attacked, super attacked, uh, yeah. thoughts there. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we just recently celebrated what the 10th anniversary of Chrome 
uh, and Chrome OS um, and Citrix was, you know, we, we would be remiss if we didn't say that Citrix was the first enterprise app in the app store for Chrome OS. Uh, and it has evolved over that time to be, I don't know, maybe we edit this part out to be kind of a, oh, what is that thing? It's not Windows. Hmm. And this, you know, this can't be a legit operating system that's going to be competitive to 10 years later. It's like, it's just second nature yep. on all of these devices and so handy and so easy to use. Sean, is that part of the consumeration of IT? Uh, yeah, I would have to say so. It's just, um, you know, it's no longer, it's almost taken that shadow IT that we had talked about previously and, and f almost flipped it around in enabling people to, to approach it as a kind of consumerized uh, uh, type of device and operating system, yet be productive and managed and secured uh, by corporate. Yeah, I'm excited to see the day I walk into a hotel uh, and in their lobby, I see a Chrome device instead of some crazily managed, imaged, um, thicker operating system device that uh, half the time is like on a blue screen of death when I get there. <laughs> well, so I, I, I'll admit I've driven through Bojangles and been the blue screen of death. <laughs> For sure. Airport kiosk, right? See, Airport kiosk, yeah. Um, so, Sean, we should take the opportunity to point out here, this uh, this blog is really about another uh, webinar or podcast or, or video blog that you guys, that you do called Between the Clouds. You want to take a moment and tell us what that concept is and promote it a little bit? Yeah, let's plug that. Uh, Between the Clouds is a consumable uh, pod, it fits under the podcast type of banner. And we get part, uh, we get guests on from the various partners in the Citrix community um, to really talk about, you know, topics that are top of mind today and, and successes, customer stories, whatever it happens to be. The Chrome OS uh, one has just been a, a a rich vein that I've tapped into recently. So, you know, I've got Richard on this one, but then another, just uh, some guests on these things. And obviously Andy, for you today, this isn't one of those cases, but in some uh, of these podcasts, I get a guest on that just blows me away. And Sahar Golistani from Chrome OS, um, I recorded another podcast with her and this one, if you're a numbers nerd, like the stats and the numbers behind uh, remote computing and all that, uh, that episode was just chock full of, of numbers. She was such an amazing guest. Richard is a great guest always, um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great popular uh, little yeah. thing I do and uh, write a blog about it, put the uh, videos in the blog and get it out there for as many people as I uh, can get eyeballs in front of. That's great. Uh, two topics for you. One is a quick and easy one. This conversation is wanting me to come back to you and talk about the nonprofit where we use Google OS uh, that I mentioned to you a few months ago. We, I mean, you, your, your, your mentality aligns perfect with what we're doing over there. So I may be bugging you about that one again. Uh, but the other thing I want to talk about is the Google ecosystem of the endpoints and the cloud-based management of the endpoints, whether using uh, uh, Google Chromebooks or whether using uh, Cloud Ready, anyway, Chrome OS, and then the backside of that having the Google Cloud infrastructure as a service. Google is one of the few players in all of this that have the ability to tell an end-to-end -end story with Citrix in the middle. Do you want to comment on that real quick? Uh, yeah, it is actually, you know, uh, I don't know if I'm going to cover that in this story here, but speaking of which, I tried to start up, uh, well, I did start up a nonprofit years ago. We're talking 98, 99, so quite a few years ago. And the intent was to loan um, laptops, which were relatively you know, uncommon back then, 
to people who were battling cancer at the time so they could have access to email and communicate with people you know, at a safe distance because they were immune compromised or whatever. And I think of the challenges I had then because they were Windows devices and they had to be you know, prepped and, and delivered and everything else uh, to the person who, who needed it. If, if Chrome had existed in those days, how oh my God, how much easier it would have been uh, to enable and to help those people out. It, it just would have been a world, a world of difference. That and the, you know, the internet access at the time was still dial up cards that you'd slide into the side of the PC or the laptop. You know, there's there's two things that come to me mind come to mind there. One, I do have a nonprofit we work with that people donate Windows devices to and they turn around and give them to us because they want when they want Chrome on it for just ease of use for their user population. Uh, but then you hit on something else that kind of ties into what I was asking you about, which is the, the cloud story. The speed and capabilities and accessibility of the internet now has made an operating system like Google Chrome OS much more viable than it would have been, what, the 10, 15 years ago when you were doing what you were doing. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, so much more so. And to talk to companies back in even the early 2000s, um, who were talking about streaming over the internet and operating system or virtual desktop. It just seemed so ludicrous until we got the, the broadband and the internet access that we have today. And now when you can stream an OS, you can stream an entire Windows uh, virtual desktop to any device off of you know, your cloud hosted environment, public or private. It's crazy the advances we made. So for this group, I want to I want to take that comment and ask another question, and we don't have to go to this a whole other podcast all by itself. But what's what's uh, what's five G going to do to that world, to where we're all basically living on Wi Fi, like carrier based Wi Fi type of solutions? Your phone becomes your hub. Your your smart device now becomes your hub. And Andy and I, you you and I have talked about that for a long time. I think what's going to end up happening is the personal device is really going to become the centric and everything you connect to is just going to be an extension of that. So an example in a healthcare facility, uh, what my vision is, is that the smartphone that's sitting in the doctor's pocket, when he comes on site, that smartphone is going to be smart enough to know by the IP address scheme that he's talking to, that he's on the internal wireless of the hospital. That will then start a Citrix authentication piece. It can either be by bio or some other way, but then he'll have those sessions started on his on his smart device. And as he moves throughout the hospital by location, we'll be able to deliver different content to him. So when he's in the OR, we're probably going to be delivering imaging content to him. But that'll be coming to a smart device. And then he'll sling that off to a you know larger screen. But once you go 5G and you have that connectivity there, that's going to be your central hub. And everything's just going to spoke off of that. And then that's what's really going to make workspace app key because you're going to be able to have the same pane of glass across any device you go to or any device that you sling to. Yeah. Hey, Sean, do you think Google based on this conversation, the cloud conversation, and now we're talking about phones, do you think they're set up well for that? I think they are. I think it's just a logical evolution uh, that they're going to be right there uh, and probably leading leading the way yeah. uh, and to Ben's note, you know, being able to determine by proximity where somebody is in the geo location and delivering the right content to them and then removing uh, the inappropriate content uh, from them based on that geo location is, is staggering. I, in fact, I've got a conversation coming up uh, tomorrow with a company who's using proximity aware this is crazy, Ben. They're using proximity aware in their uh, in their micro app for Citrix Workspace that will actually mimic the conversations that you would hear in an office. So if we're physically away from each other in this virtual environment, then I'm not hearing you as loud as I could if you were standing right next to me in the in the virtual environment. It's crazy, crazy stuff. 
So, Bill Sudden, we've uh, we've kind of talked a lot, a lot, and give you a chance to chime in here. Are you uh, are we are we reinvigorating your desire to go, you know, lab your Google world back up? Of course, absolutely. I, 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 what Ben said is very interesting, and uh, I think that'll take longer than five years, but uh, I'd love to see us get there. Um, but as far as labbing it up, yeah, I, that's definitely something I'm going to want to take advantage of here going forward. I love the fact that this integrates with Citrix Endpoint Management. Um, I, I don't know that I was aware that that was part of it, but uh, that's it. that'd be something interesting to look at as well. Well, and, and the comment back to that, and you know, it's in, in the blog here, but Citrix Endpoint Management, Citrix Workspace, uh, Citrix Workspace Service, CVAD, um, the ability to do this on a phone. This is where this Google story is good, but then Citrix makes it enterprise worthy. Mm -hmm. Yes. See, that's the key to me is that, you know, I, I think the Google stuff's cool, but I think when you partner it out with Citrix and then you can start bringing some of the Citrix analytics play into this, you know, you really can start to develop a really secure model. Not only will you be able to detect problems, but you, in some cases with the analytics products that we have, be able to remediate those problems. But a lot of that hinges around running workspace app on those devices. And I think that's where the Google platform is just the skeleton and the workspace app is what really provides the meat and the functionality of it. So when do we go from Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z to generation Chrome? Because I would argue that with the kids all getting Chrome deliver, hand delivered to them for school and using it throughout their entire educational career, is it? I'm going to coin it here first. I want this trademark. Somebody who's who's in charge of trademarking? Well, I am recording, so okay. So Generation Chrome yep. is going to be the next generation. I, I think we're there. I, I've got kids that use Google Apps and use the Chromebook all day. Uh, use Chrome browser even uh, mm -hmm. all day at school. They went and recently attended a community college, and they asked them to install a thick app, a fat app, and they had to come home and ask me what that even was, and it was. Um, you know, uh, it was a, an app that all of us have used for years and years and years. They didn't even know where to start. So guys, I can see Steve Jobs rolling in his grave right now. He doesn't like the term Generation Chrome. He wanted that to be Generation Apple. Right. I think he got his Generation Apple. Yeah, he got it. Side. He had, he had just, it for sure. I just don't know if he's going to have it on the enterprise side. And at the end of the day, that's where the big opportunity is. Yeah, but I think that I think the enterprise side will I mean, with this whole work from home thing, all that's gotten blurred. I mean, my personal life, my professional life, maybe it's just me, but those have kind of become one in the same. I don't work eight to five anymore. I might work seven to nine and take a little break and come back at 10 and work from 10 to 12 to one. And so I'm doing work in various shifts where. I mean, I'll be example. I was at Carowinds yesterday and I was doing some work while I was waiting in the line for the Fury roller coaster. So it's all kind of become blended to me these days. Well, that, that's what I was going to bring up and take this conversation to operating systems like Google Chrome OS allows us to have personal alongside work and vice versa and intermingled and, and but secure from each other, throw in the Citrix uh, story as well. All of a sudden it becomes blurred and that's okay. Blurred and secured all at the same time. Let me throw my best Southern accent and try to say that again. And balanced. We got to keep balance. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate you joining today and, and having this conversation. Sean, we'll have you back on. We'll keep an eye out for the blogs you're writing around this topic and others. And uh, anytime you can join us, great. All right. It was great fun. I appreciate being here. Uh, ben, anything before I let you go? No, Sean, it was good meeting you virtually. Uh, I'm a fan of yours. I, I, when I would go to the Citrix events, I always loved the wild costumes you would wear and, and, the, uh, and the games that you were playing. So, man, I've been a big fan of yours for a long time. It's very good to meet you virtually, man. And I look forward to being able to work with you uh, more in the future. And Andy and Zintegra crowd, as always, man, I love that you guys have me on this. I always learn something from it. So if you can keep my participation in it, I would uh, love to be here. So thank you. Yeah, we, we know you just enjoy talking about this stuff. Uh, John Splone, anything? Uh, nothing really much to add. I look forward to uh, where Chrome's coming or where it's going, uh, especially with the Citrix relationship. I know uh, the demo days, uh, Citrix demo days that you had, uh, 
uh, was at the beginning of the month. Um, I know Christian had a nice long fireside conversation with Google as well. So yeah. it's definitely some good stuff coming forward between that relationship. More to come. Yes, looking forward to it. Hey, Billy. Yeah, I like a look of their look of their statements and saying that I'm interested, I'm interested really, really forward to what's going on and, going and, and, and uh, increasing, increasing uh, uh, development around the MLS and the MLS and Citrix. Bill became a Cylon. Suddenly in the witness protection program. Holy cow. <laughs> blur his screen out. <laughs> yeah, it's been a little um, a little rough, a little bit throughout the Bill, Bill that one just went crazy on us. Um, Max Headroom ish. Um, I know oh, sorry know. about that. No, you're good. Virtual now. desktop. I guess there was some latency or something. So yeah, no worries. Well, Sean, last chance. Uh, anything else you'd want to tell our audience while we have them? Keep tuning in. We're going to have a lot more between the clouds. And then keep tuning in here to uh, the Zentegra folks. Great partnership. And I'm looking forward to uh, doing a lot more with you guys. All right, guys. Thank you. Appreciate you guys joining. Bye.